All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar series about Beyond Diagonal Reconfigurable Intelligence Surfaces. This webinar series was organized by the Special Interest Group about VDRIS, which was recently established in the IEEE Communication Society. My name is Matteo Nerini. I'm with the Imperial College London, and I will be your host for today. And this is our second webinar of the series, and today is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Edward Jolswick with the University, the Technical University of Braunschweig as our uh, distinguished speaker. Edward is a well-known figure in our community. It doesn't need to be introduced, but let me uh, briefly uh, make an introduction of his background. Edward is an IEEE uh, fellow. He was born in 1975 in Berlin. Uh, he's currently the Managing Director of the Institute of Communications Technology and the Head of the Chair of Communication Systems, and full professor at the Technical University of Braunschweig. Previously, he was for 11 years the Head of the Chair of Communications Theory and full professor at the Technical University of, De of Dresden. Edward's uh, research interests cover the area of communication, signal processing, applied information theory, and communication theory. He has published 15 book chapters, one book, four monographs, and hundreds of journals and conference papers on these topics. Recently, he published two monographs, the first on ultra-reliable low latency communications, and the second on information theory and mathematical optimization for uh, 6G. Since 2017, he has been serving as a editor-in-chief of the EURASIP Journal of Wireless Communications and Networking. He also serves as the editor for IEEE Transactions on Communications and Transactions on Information Theory. And in the past, he was on the editorial boards of uh, IEEE Signal Processing Letters and several IEEE Transactions journals. In 2006, he received the uh, IEEE Signal Processing Society Best Paper Award and he also won uh, several best paper and best student paper awards in uh, multiple IEEE uh, conferences. Uh, let me now uh, remind you the rules of this webinar before starting. So the talk will uh, take more or less 50 minutes uh, during which the audience will be muted. But if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. After the talk, there will be a 10 minute uh, Q&A uh, session in which uh, you can raise your hand, ask questions, or otherwise I will pick, I will select questions from the chat. So enjoy the talk and Edward, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for the very nice kind introduction. I hope you can see the slides now. Yes, yes, perfect. Okay. Yeah, so welcome to this uh, webinar for Beyond Diagonal RIS, and I will talk about optimization. Um, I, I present joint work here, um, first of all, with a complete working group that we have in our national 6G research and innovation cluster, 6G RIC, which is funded by the Ministry of Education and Research. And um, second, it's a collaboration with uh, colleagues uh, Ignacio Santa Maria, Mohamed Soleimani, and Jesus Guterres. And uh, we are collaborating in a 6G SNS European project, which is called 6G Census. Okay, so for the introduction and motivation, um, I think most of us currently work on novel technologies, which are considered as uh, fundamental for the sixth generation of mobile communications. And um, they include um, uh, the development of massive MIMO systems, non-orthogonal transmissions, including non-orthogonal multiple access, NOMA, including um, rate splitting multiple access, and also looking at higher frequency bands like millimeter wave, even up to terahertz or optical. And we do this because we want to enable higher data rates, we want to support more devices, and we want to improve reliability. 
coming from 5G, we now have heterogeneous or mixed use cases where several of these demanding and challenging requirements are to be fulfilled. All the technologies that we currently look at, they rely on the propagation environment. For example, the rank of a multiple antenna channel influenced by the number of scatterers we have in the environment and which is also influenced um, by the received power from intermittent links. So these propagation environments, they uh, have a direct impact on the achievability of our performance goal. The idea to introduce large reflecting surfaces popped up maybe uh, more than five years ago. Um, and the idea is that you can control the electromagnetic properties of the environment. And that basically leads to a paradigm shift because as wireless engineers, we were used to take the channel as given by nature. And we were focusing on optimizing the transceiver, the transmitter side, signal processing, channel coding, maybe the scheduling, the resource mapping. And at the receiver side, the decoding, the demapping, the signal processing, the equalization, and so on. But these reconfigurable intelligent surfaces now really are a paradigm shift because we can include them and uh, in our optimization and in our system design to manipulate the properties of the wireless channel according to our needs. Here's only some state of the art in this very, very hot and um, relevant research area. We observed an explosion in research activity regarding the design and optimization of RIS assisted wireless communication systems. Maybe one of the very early work was to improve the signal processing in multiple antenna systems where the reconfigurable surface uh, influenced the rank of the effective MIMO channel metrics. Um, there are many works, I cannot list all of them, that's clear. So for a recent survey, um, maybe reference number five is a good starting point. There are several open challenges. Um, the RIS models um, look simplified from a um, circuit theory point of view. So there is a model mismatch between um, the models that we use in a, for our signal processing and optimization and the practical implementations. Fortunately, we have already a number of prototypes available and we learn more and more about it. However, we can also take a different approach starting from circuit theory in order to model these RIS. And that is also one other motivation I will come back to. Another challenge is that we would need hundreds or even thousands of elements in order to get a noticeable performance gain. Of course, the energy that is reflected is proportional to the area of the surface. So going to higher frequencies, smaller reflecting elements, you would need a large number of them in order to reflect a significant amount of energy. Um, recently, people have looked at scenarios where you place the RIS close to the transmitter or to the receiver side, because then you are operating in the near field and you do not suffer from two um, path loss, a uh, path loss um, for two channels. Finally, the model assumptions that were made in the very beginning, uh, such as independent fading for the receiver to RIS and uh, um, the RIS to the transmitter link, uh, are not realistic. Um, and it depends on the implementation of the RIS. There's coupling. But this type of coupling can be also exploited. So more recently, um, people have looked at the structure of the underlying uh, hardware and the impact on the signal model for the RIS assisted links. So here we take a look at a very simple single point to point link. The received signal Y is then given as the direct link plus the RIS assisted link, which consists of the product of the channel from the RIS to the receiver G, the RIS channel matrix, matrix theta, 
and the channel from the transmitter to the RISH times the transmitted symbol plus additive noise. So that, that corresponds to the scenario on the right-hand side shown here. We have a single antenna transmitter, single antenna receiver, and the channel, the direct channels denoted by D and the indirect channels uh, denoted by H and G. And the channel, um, the effective channel is determined by the reflection properties of the RIS and that is covered in the matrix theta. Classical approaches considered theta to be a diagonal matrix because the idea was if you have single reflecting elements which are isolated, like shown on the left-hand side here, then each of them contributes to a reflection. A reflection might correspond to a phase shift of the signal. So the model for the conventional RIS in the beginning was a diagonal matrix with constant modulus entries, uh, basically terms e to the power j uh, phase. And the phase shift of these individual reflecting elements can be controlled by the circuit behind that. When analyzing the coupling effects here, then it turns out that the structure of the matrix theta is more complex. And um, not only by nature, this coupling can occur, you can also voluntarily influence the coupling between RIS elements. And that has been done in the research called Beyond Diagonal RIS, where you connect the different part of your RIS, so the different RIS elements, not only with your own uh, um, impedance, but you have a network where you connect different RIS elements which, uh, with each other. Depending on the realization of this network and depending on the properties of um, the connections in terms of the graph structure, very recently, it was shown uh, how the structure of the corresponding matrix theta changes. And with structure, we mainly mean what are the constraints that we have when we want to design our matrix theta. Um, before I explain the constraint sets, let's remember what we would like to do as engineers. Our goal is that we can modify the matrix theta as we like. Since the RIS in the first place is a passive device, and we will follow the approach that it's passive here as well, we cannot introduce new energy. But what we would really like to do is we can choose any element of this matrix theta uh, as we like, and we keep a power constraint, so a passive power constraint, um, and satisfy the passive power constraint. So in the very beginning for the diagonal RIS, we had a constraint that it was a diagonal matrix. Of course, this is a very strong restriction. And the other restriction was that we have only phase shifts that we can uh, choose. Um, so basically the parameters, parameters theta one to theta n. That's a very restricted constraint set. Now, for beyond diagonal RIS, in this paper number seven, um, there was a, um, a model developed based on the scattering parameter network analysis. And it turns out that you can describe uh, the matrix theta by the underlying properties of the electric network. Z0 is some reference impedance, usually set to 50 ohm. And B is the so-called susceptance matrix B, which is related also to the scattering matrix that many of us have learned in um, circuits and systems. So here we have more degrees of freedom um, because we can choose the complete matrix B more or less. And then we, uh, by this, we can compute the resulting matrix theta. So we have a larger class of constraints or a larger constraint set for our matrix theta. Finally, the fully connected RIS um, is a very general model where you allow uh, all different RIS elements to have connections. And basically you can transfer the received energy from the RIS elements within the network 
to the RIS elements, you would like to reflect the energy to the um, wanted direction. And in this case, for the fully connected RIS, it was shown, I think also in this paper, that you can choose choose theta freely as a symmetric matrix and it has to be a, a unitary matrix as well so theta Hermitian times theta has to be equal to the identity matrix so you see the constraint set um, uh, grows the more prop or the more um, possibilities you offer for the RIS to redistribute the received energy and transmit it in certain directions. Now, we are mainly interested in the optimization of those RIS. I told you that now we have the great position that we can optimize our transmitter, our receiver, and we can influence and optimize the channels by choosing the matrix theta. Why do we need to compute the optimal performance? Because we want to decide for a specific RIS design. We want to know when the overhead associated with a certain design, like a fully connected beyond diagonal RIS, shows significant gains in terms of our performance metrics. And we want to understand also the interplay of the beyond diagonal RIS and the other 6G technologies that we are currently looking at. We want to know when is it beneficial to place beyond diagonal RIS and which type of RIS architecture should we choose? So in terms of optimization theory, you can see here on the right-hand side, very idealized the constraint sets. So coming from a smaller constraint set for diagonal RIS to larger constraint sets, like partially connected or fully connected, allows us to have more degrees of freedom and the optimization problem can be solved with a better value. So the outcome of our optimization will get better and better the larger the constraint set is. So, so the goals of this webinar are the following. We want to understand which optimization methods could be used to solve RIS optimization problems or which solution concepts are available in general to either solve these different classes of constraint set problems or maybe other uh, constraints that will come up in the future. And then in the second goal is that we want to discuss synergies of beyond diagonal RIS with other um, 6G technologies like rate splitting or ultra reliable low latency communications. Part one is based on this publication here. It's on the optimization of beyond diagonal RIS using Takagi's factorization. It's a joint work with Ignacio Santamaria, Mohamed Soleimani, and Yasses Utels. So now we directly start with the corresponding optimization problem. If you have a point-to-point -point link, and there is for the simplicity, there is no direct path first. Then what we want to do is we want to maximize the received signal power. The received signal power is shown over here. It's basically the product of the channels uh, from the transmitter. This is the channel vector from the transmit antenna to all RIS elements times the RIS matrix theta times the channels from the RIS to the receiver. The goal is easy. We want to maximize the absolute square such that we have a fully connected beyond diagonal risk, so we have unitary constraints and symmetry constraints. The good thing is that we can solve this optimization problem in closed form, and that's based on Takagi's factorization, which is a special case of the singular value decomposition for symmetric matrices, um, and in this case here of a certain complex symmetric matrix, because you see from the constraints we have both. We have a symmetry constraint and we have the unitary constraint. So in theorem one, there is the Takagi factorization given. So let A be a symmetric matrix. It's complex n by n. Then there exists an n by n unitary matrix Q and an n by n positive semidefinite diagonal matrix sigma, such that A can be written as Q times sigma times Q transpose. 
It looks very similar to the singular value or the eigenvalue decomposition. So it looks similar to the eigenvalue decomposition where you decompose a Hermitage matrix A into the eigenvectors times the diagonal matrix with eigenvalues and the conjugate transpose of the eigenvector matrix. Here, this is very similar, but for complex symmetric matrices. Um, it's an old mm, known result. You see it's, yeah, it's 100 years old, exactly. Now, in order to solve optimization problem P1, we have the following proposition. So we define the product of um, the channels from the transmitter to the RIS and from the RIS to the receiver as lambda 1, which is the largest eigenvalue, times the um, um, eigenvectors of the transmitter and the receiver corresponding to the largest eigenvalues. This is the rank 1 outer product matrix between the received channel. You have the received signal, um, this received channel um, norm times the received channel direction and the transmit channel, which can be written as the transmit channel norm and the transmit channel direction. And lambda 1 is the product of the two um, channel norms. Then we form the rank 2 symmetric complex matrix A as follows. We take this the directions UR times UT Hermitage, this is a matrix, plus the same matrix transpose. And for this matrix A, we compute Takagi's factorization, where Q is the unitary matrix and sigma is the matrix with the Takagi values or singular values of A. Since we have two rank one matrices here that we sum up, the rank of this resulting matrix is at most two, and we have two Takagi values sigma 1 and sigma 2, which are not equal to 0. All the other entries are 0. Then the solution of optimization problem P1 is that we choose theta equal to the matrix Q times Q transpose. So that's very easy. After we have computed the factorization, we take the uh, Takagi singular vectors and multiply it with the transpose. Uh, in order to get a symmetric matrix theta. And the maximum signal power that is achieved with this optimal solution is obviously equal to lambda 1 square, which is the product of the um, norm of the first channel vector times the second channel vector. So for the proof, you can take a look at this reference over here. Now, we have several remarks and extensions. So the first one is um, that uh, we include a direct channel. So we can easily do that. So we have to um, um, compute the effective channel, which is the sum of the indirect channel and the direct channel, and then the solution uh, for the um, optimization problem is very similar. We take again the um, oops, Takagi transform and compute the um, uh, Takagi singular vectors. And then we can also compute the resulting optimal channel gain of the overall matrix with the optimum theta inserted. And that's basically the, the channel gain that we have from our direct channel plus lambda one. Okay, so let's take a look at the simulation result because the motivation was we want to understand whether it is beneficial to apply a beyond diagonal RIS. And um, in this first experiment, we evaluate the signal to noise ratio gain of the beyond diagonal RIS using the optimal design for different group sizes with respect to the SNR that is achieved with the classical diagonal RIS that uses the optimal phases. So you know the optimal phases of the diagonal RIS can be also easily computed one after the other in order uh, to maximize the received signal power. And we plot here the SNR gain and dB over the number of RIS elements on the x-axis. Uh, first of all, we can see that the fully connected 
beyond diagonal RIS model here shows the most gains. So we can gain here up to about 2.1 dB. And these results are also in agreement with the theoretical analysis that has been done in this reference 12 over here, um, where it is shown that this gain, uh, if you let the number of RIS elements go to infinity, con converges. So in this setup, um, we had the following. We um, had here the, the, the transmitter, oh, sorry, the, the transmitter here, um, the RIS and the receiver. The direct line of sight was blocked. You can see here also the positions in meters and the RIS is placed at a certain height here in order to reflect the signals. Path loss is computed according to this equation with path, path loss coefficient equal to 3.75. For the group size, so the um, beyond diagonal RIS architectures where you have always small groups of RIS elements that you connect um, for group size eight, four, and two, you can see that the gain, the gain uh, are a little bit less. Um, and uh, as a rule of thumb, you can see that here for a group size of two, we can have about one dB gain There are other extensions possible, and I want to remark one thing. Um, we have seen that this matrix A that is needed to compute the optimal solution is only rank two. Since we have many more uh, degrees of freedom, um, we can also exploit that. So the optimal solution is not unique. In particular, the null space corresponding to the zero Takagi values allows us to use any uh, rotation. So the unitary matrix could be partitioned into the signal and noise subspace, and then we could generate easily a new matrix, a new basis for the noise subspace and optimize. That could have an impact not on the received signal power at the intended receiver, but it will impact interference at other locations. Another question is about um, the closed form solution. So of course, Takagi's factorization, like the eigenvalue decomposition, has to be computed in an algorithm. And here it is outlined how this can be done in an efficient way. And it is really, um, yeah, it's really uh, um, consists only of several steps. So it's not that you have to perform an iterative algorithm. And this is from the reference over here, a divide and conquer method for the Takagi factorization. What you actually do is first you start with the standard singular value decomposition of the matrix A into the product of the left singular values F, the uh, sorry, the left singular vectors F, the diagonal matrix with singular values K and the right singular values G Hermitage. Then you compute uh, the vector T, which is the diagonal entries of this matrix product F conjugate transpose G conjugate. Then you have to compute the angle of the entries of this vector T. Then you calculate uh, matrix F prime, which is given by F times the diagonal matrix with these faces from step two. And then the Takagi factorization is simply given by the following A is equal to F prime times K times F prime transpose. And from this, we can directly then compute our beyond diagonal RIS matrix as F prime times F prime transpose. So it's straightforward to compute it. Um, now there was also another solution method proposed in the reference over here. So actually it was um, submitted before we have submitted our work. It was uh, done independently and during the review process of our paper, we got informed about that. So the work in the reference 11, which um, uh, is accepted and will appear in transactions on wireless communication, is based on a different factorization of the beyond diagonal RIS matrix, which is given here. It is factorized in a real orthogonal matrix V and the diagonal matrix D. And in this reference, there are closed form expressions derived for the vectors of the matrix V, considering separately 
the cases where you have two, three, and more RIS elements. Okay, so in contrast, our solution is based on one um, factorization. It can be obtained directly through the SVD for any number of RIS elements. And since we have this constraint on the symmetry of the RIS matrix, we believe that this Takagi factorization is really a natural fit to the problem, and it provides a very simple and easily accessible solution. Okay, so we can also apply the approach to the group connected beyond diagonal RIS. That's basically very simple because you perform the decomposition for each individual group separately. So we then get a solution which maximizes the received signal power of that corresponding group. And since we know that uh, this uh, resulting um, uh, channel coefficient is real valued, they add up coherently in an optimal way. So basically, we can also solve optimization problem P2 for the group, group connected beyond diagonal RIS, where we optimize the um, each group, so the RIS matrix of each group separately. It basically decouples into G independent subproblems, each of which we solve by performing the corresponding decomposition. Another extension is towards multiple antennas, either at the transmitter or at the receiver side. That means multiple input signal output or single input multiple output channels. In this case, we have an optimization problem which looks like P3 on the right upper side of the slide. We want to maximize the uh, norm squared of a matrix product. Um, first, a matrix from the multiple transmit antennas to the multiple RIS elements times the RIS matrix theta times the channel vector from the RIS to the receive antenna. The constraint set is the same. And here we can also um, follow the same approach. The optimal symmetric and unitary beyond diagonal matrix that maximizes this um, objective function is given by theta equal to Q times Q transpose, where Q is a unitary matrix that is also obtained from a Takagi factorization. This time, we also take UR as before. So UR are the directions of the channel from the RIS to the receiver. But we take this time the eigenvector for the transmitter channel that corresponds to the largest left singular vector of our channel matrix HT. So if we perform a singular value decomposition of this matrix HT into the singular value, left singular values, ah, sorry, left singular vectors, diagonal matrix with singular vectors and right singular vectors, um, we take the um, uh, singular vector, which corresponds to the largest singular value. This is UT1. And then basically we plug this into the same approach and we can compute the optimal theta in closed form. Interestingly, a similar objective function occurs also if you take a look at the multiple user, multiple access channel. So in the K user, single antennas, single input, single output, multiple access channel, we end up with the following achievable sum rate. The sum rate of the system is equal to the logarithm of one plus the sum of the total received power. This includes the contributions from all individual users uh, um, divided by the noise power. And now if you rewrite this here in matrix form, so you collect basically the multiple access um, channel into the channel matrix HT, we are ending up with this, the same optimization problem that we have just solved. So therefore, we can also apply the Takagi um, factorization for this case and maximize the sum rate in the k-user seismomech. And we have done that in the second simulation example. We evaluate here the sum rate in bits per second per hertz over the number of RIS elements for a two-user single antenna multiple access channel. Um, noise power is equal to minus 174 dBm per hertz. System bandwidth is 2 megahertz. Transmit power is 20 dBm for the two users. So we have individual, individual power constraints in the uplink. And we include here um, the diagonal classical RIS with optimized phases. This is the red curve. 
we have the fully connected beyond diagonal, this is the blue curve. And we also plot the RIS with random faces as a baseline scheme here in gray. And we can see that we have a slight gain in terms of the achievable sum rate uh, from the beyond diagonal um, architecture. Okay, so the conclusions from part one is that if we have a new constraint set, which comes from the underlying um, realization of the beyond diagonal RIS, then um, we want to optimize and solve the corresponding performance optimization problems. Then uh, we um, have to look for the corresponding tools. And in this case, due to the symmetry constraint, Takagi, Takagi factorization is the right tool to solve that. There are some open problems along, along this line. So we have the extension to the MIMO case. We, are, we actually have uh, solved this case as well. And we, will, we are currently working on the publication that will be submitted very soon. So we can also solve the MIMO case, not in closed form, but we have a very low complex optimal algorithm. It would be also interesting to consider other uh, metrics, other performance metrics here in this, for example, the capacity um, in the MIMO links, the weighted sum rate in the MAC, or maybe the interference leakage or the information leakage in uh, interference or wiretap channels. All right, so that was the first part of the tutorial. Let's take a look at the second part. Here we want to understand what is the interplay between the beyond diagonal RIS architecture and how does it benefit or uh, relate to other 6G technologies. The results from this paper are uh, from this part are in the paper mentioned here by Mohamed Solimiani, Ignacio Santa Maria, myself, and Bruno Clarks. Yeah, so we are now picking certain 6G technologies that we want to use and see whether they can be combined with beyond diagonal RIS. The first one is rate splitting multiple access. That's a technology that you might also very well know. Um, this is a technology that can manage and mitigate interference between multiple users because it offers more degrees of freedom than treating interference as noise or performing superposition coding and successive interference cancellation like in NOMA. The second technology is for uh, low latency communications where we have short block length. So in this case, um, we look at second order capacity expressions. So not the first order capacity that we have looked at in the first part of the tutorial uh, of the webinar, but we will take a look at second order capacity. So here, the error performance enters as a system and a design parameter. And finally, energy efficiency is a very important metric these days. Systems get more and more complex, and we want to have um, low energy consumption. So RIS are known to operate in a very energy efficient way, and therefore, the energy efficiency can, can be considered. So you see here a list of uh, references that considered RAS, finite block length, so second order rates, multi-user communication, multiple antenna, energy efficiency, rate splitting, multiple access, uh, spectral efficiency metrics, and beyond diagonal RAS. And uh, you can see in this area the research about the impact of beyond diagonal RAS architecture has just started. Our system model is as follows. We have a multi-cell broadcast channel, which is assisted by um, first layer rate split, um, first layer uh, rate splitting. And we also apply multiple RIS. So we basically have one RIS in each cell, at least. Uh, we have multiple transmit antennas at the base stations. And we assume that each base station serves K single antenna users. And we have, as I said, more than um, a more beyond diagonal and or regular classical RIS with a certain number of elements. 
In this work, we assume that we have perfect global and instantaneous channel state information available at all transmitters and at all receivers. This allows us to compare the performance without suffering um, from yeah, difficult um, modeling assumptions on the CSI uncertainties. For the RIS models, uh, we end up with the signal model, which looks like this. The effective channel from um, base station L to user K in cell I is um, the link obtained through the RIS. We have M RIS, therefore we have a sum of M tho of those terms plus the direct link. For the regular classical RIS, the matrix theta Theta M is a diagonal matrix. In the case of beyond diagonal RIS, we model it as a symmetric non-diagonal matrix. And for the group connected, we have different group sizes here. We only consider group size two. Then it's a block diagonal matrix with uh, two by two blocks on the diagonal. We also have two different constraints for the, for the symmetry. First one is, um, yeah, we, so we have a symmetry constraints for sure. And we consider either unitary constraint on the right-hand side, this is called TI, or if the product of theta times theta Hermitage is smaller than or equal to the identity matrix, then we have the constraint TU. The second constraint basically corresponds to the case where some energy that is received is not reflected but absorbed by the RIS. Yeah, as said, we consider the first layer uh, rate splitting approach. That means we have one common message for all users in a cell and then the private messages for the individual users and we add them up in a superposition coding approach. The received signal for the users is then given as follows. We have the desired um, common signal with the common messages. We have the desired private message signal. We have interference created within the own cell, intracell interference. We have intercell interference created by the other cells, and we have additive noise. From this, we can derive the second order rates that are achievable for decoding. Here we see the achievable rates for the common message. We have the first order term, which is log one plus S, I, and R. And then we have the second order term, which consists of the inverse Q function times the error probability times the square root of the channel dispersion divided by the block length. NC is the length of the block code. And the SINR is given as follows. We have the received signal power of the useful common message signal. We have noise power plus the interference signals from the other cells of the common messages and all the private messages of the of all the other cells and the own cell. The dispersion term here, V, is uh, here the uh, computed as an achievable dispersion for Gaussian signals in an interference limited system. Uh, we have used this achievable dispersion and not the optimal dispersion because this allows us to uh, compute the achievable second order rates easier than if we would use um, shell codes, which are dispersion optimal. Now, in order to have a common message decodable for all users, we have this constraint for the common messages, and then each user decodes, cancels the common message, and then afterwards, it decodes its own private message, treating the remaining signals as noise. So the re achievable rates for the private messages are the first order term minus the second order term as well, where we have the SINR expression, which looks very, very similar. Um, here we have the received signal power for the private message of that user divided by intra and intercell interference, but without interference from the common message. The achievable dispersion is shown over here. And now we can compute the overall achievable rate for this particular user. And that's the sum of the private and the common message rates. And finally, the energy efficiency for that user is defined as the achievable rate divided by the total consumed energy. 
Now, the problem statement is as follows. We want to jointly optimize the rate splitting multiple access parameters, the beam forming vectors, the transmission power, and the RIS elements. This is a very general optimization problem. We, you see we have here general utility functions. We have rate requirements, so the users have to fulfill a rate. Um, we have the constraints for the common messages. And basically, we can plug in different objective functions now. We can plug in the spectral efficiency or energy efficiency objective. We can also take a minimum weighted rate or a weighted sum rate, minimum weighted energy efficiency, or even global energy efficiency optimization. And then the proposed algorithm that is able to find a suitable uh, low complexity solution is an iterative algorithm based on majorization, minimization, and alternating optimization between the different optimization parameters. However, there's one difference here. We, we have the second order rates. So in order to have the feasibility with respect to the rate requirements, we have to have a careful initialization. The main tool in order to come up with this majorization minimization approach is to find a suitable lower bound, which is concave and quadratic for both the common and the private rates. I will not go into the details here because um, that is very a lot of small symbols, but the point is that it is possible to derive lower bounds which fulfill the requirements uh, in order to apply them to the MM algorithm. This holds for the optimization of the beam forming vectors. The resulting um, surrogate optimization problem then is convex in the beam forming vectors, so we can easily solve it with numerical methods. If you have um, energy efficiency functions, we can apply the Dinkelbach based algorithms and then also can find the solution easily. For the optimization of the RIS elements, we can also find bounds, which are basically a similar approach like the bounds we have found for the optimization of the beamforming vectors. So here in this corollary, again, a concave lower bound for the common rate um, is provided. In the paper, you also find a, common, uh, a concave lower bound for the private message rates. And again, we can then uh, uh, substitute our objective functions accordingly, and the surrogate programming problem looks like this. Unfortunately, it is not yet convex because of the constraints that we have uh, in the uh, RIS elements. And this means we have to convexify also the constraint set. And that can be done here for the practical relevant case for the group connected beyond diagonal RIS with group size two. And we apply basically the convexity as a convex concave procedure. So if you have equality constraints, this here are the constraints you get from the unitary constraint, then you can express them with a inequality in one direction and an inequality in the other direction. And by this, you can convexify the constraint set. This leads me to the numerical results here. We plot the average fairness rate over the error probability. Fairness rate is the um, minimum of the user rates. And we compare uh, on the y-axis the fairness rate over the error probability for our second order uh, rate expressions epsilon for different um, schemes. First of all, we have 20 elements at the RIS. We have um, two base stations with only two, uh, with only two antennas. No, uh, sorry, um, let me check that. So we have uh, 200, uh, so we have a block length of 200 bits, that's clear. Um, we have six users. We have five antennas at the base station. We have a transmit power constraint of 10 dB and in the simulation a rise factor of three. So uh, let me just repeat what uh, L and M are to make sure that we get this right. Yeah, so M is the number of uh, RISs and L is the number of base stations, the number of cells. 
yeah so it's a it's a, a reasonable size scenario the curves with RSBD RIS correspond to the proposed beyond diagonal RIS with different constraint sets. They are always indicated by U or by I. Then we have the rate splitting RIS with classical diagonal RIS or treating interference as noise with classical RIS. And then we have also for comparison the first order capacity results, the Shannon rates for the uh, rate splitting beyond diagonal RIS. Yeah, and this is the best curve here, the first order terms. And then we can see that um, the proposed scheme, which is the rate splitting with beyond diagonal RIS, optimized with the inequality constraint, gives the best result. This is the green curve, followed by the classical uh, RIS together with rate splitting. So the gain in terms of going from classical RIS to beyond diagonal RIS with a group size of two here is um, yeah, visible, but may, might not be significant. Then we have um, this uh, third best curve is this one with the magenta. This is with the constraint set, which is fulfilled with equality. First the beyond diagonal and then the classical diagonal RIS. This is the blue curve. Without RIS, we are here in the red uh, side. So we can clearly see the gain that we obtain from going to um, from using an RIS assisted system. Okay, and as a lower bound, we have here treating interference as noise, no uh, RIS. This is basically the lower bound that we can see here. So in this uh, graph, we can already get a feeling about which technology provides which gain in terms of the achievable rate. Yeah, we also have other um, comparisons in the paper. Um, usually uh, the outcome or the take home messages is as follows. The rate splitting multiple access clearly outperforms treating interference as noise. And if we have an, a system where we have a larger number of users compared to the number of antennas at the base station, then the RIS in the optimal, the optimized RIS support the interference management. And if we have a really overloaded scenario, we can see a gain from the rate splitting, from the optimization of beam forming and from the RIS. So all together work to provide the gains in terms of the fairness rate. So that concludes the second part. Um, both technologies, rate splitting and RIS, can significantly improve the spectral efficiency and energy efficiency. Um, the RIS improves the benefits of the RS of, of the rate splitting in overloaded systems. Um, the benefits of the uh, rate splitting increase with the number of users. And if we go to shorter packet length, so shorter block length, then the rate splitting even provides higher gains. And that is also true if we have a higher reliability constraint, so if the error probability is larger. Now, the way forward, I already mentioned that. Uh, we have now uh, uh, tried to solve the MIMO case for the first part. We have solved the MIMO case with beyond diagonal RIS. And what is uh, what seems to be very relevant is to look also at active RIS. Active in a sense that it provides some power amplification. So not uh, with its own data, but it has some energy uh, that it provides. And basically the most capable RIS variant that we have seen so far in the discussions is the active RIS where you have global reflection properties. That means you basically take the received energy and you can freely redistribute it among all RIS elements. And you can also feed in your own um, power that you have at the active RIS. And from our initial simulation, it seems that this setup can really provide tremendous gains. OK, that brings me to the final slide. I listed here our publications. I want to mention also our publications on the so-called 
non-regenerative two-way and single-way relaying networks because they are basically what is now called uh, the active RIS with global reflection properties. You find all the references also at the link provided here. Thank you for the attention. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much for the very clear and interesting talk. So now it's time for, for questions from the audience. Okay, so first of all, I read a question in the chat. It's uh, quite long. So uh, sorry, Tien, I will try to summarize it. Uh, basically the question regards the unitary and symmetric constraints of the scattering matrix theta. And the question is about where they come from and if some ideal assumptions are made. Yeah, if you could shed some light on this, thank you. Yes, oh, no, I stopped the sharing, which was not intended. Um, so the question is about um, the, yeah, basically we can go to any uh, slide um, where we have the constraints on the theta. So the question here, yeah. so the question basically is uh, if we take only the unitary constraint into account, uh, is that oversimplified? Because there might be also, um, there might be also a coupling between elements and maybe there are also some other effects in the in the circuits. And we have here also the very nice work of uh, the moderator and um, the colleagues. So the question basically is um, whether we should include some other effects um, that comes from the coupling between the antenna ports or the antenna, the RIS elements, other than the impedance network that we see here. And I think, yes, that could be done. There are some models in the literature. Basically, they they impact the uh, description. They impact the description of the um, scattering matrix or the susceptance matrix B. And they could be taken into account. So my answer would be, we have not taken them into account. But taking them into account and understanding the impact on the performance would be interesting. And then even going one step beyond would be to know that there are coupling effects and design your scattering metrics in a way that takes this knowledge into account as site information. So I think this is very interesting work in order to make the system more robust. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, then there is another question from the chat uh, about page 18. Uh, considering that figure, is it worth using? Oh, yeah. Is it worth using beyond diagonal RIS with this complex structure while it is possible to achieve the same performance with classic diagonal RIS with more uh, RIS elements? Yes, ah, yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, you can you, you basically can translate the gain in terms of sum rate also in a gain in terms of DB, uh, SNR and DB. And of course you can also translate that in the um, in the number of RS elements. Yeah, that's 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 correct. So you can see it clearly in the figure. So basically um, this uh, traditional RIS curve, which is the red one, is a shifted version of the blue one. So basically, it means if you increase the number of RIS elements from the red to the blue curve, you can achieve the same performance. That's right. But let me stress that this also heavily depends on the um, scenario and the channel model. Um, so it depends on how, how the uh, Reichland factor is. If you have line of sight, so you need line of sight components for the RIS, obviously, in order to get enough um, energy and the, then the, the question always is how you model these links um, i think in the end um, yeah the point is um, whether it's worth to to use a fully uh, connected beyond diagonal ris is not clear however let me also advertise the work of our colleagues here uh, let me go back. Um, in this in this reference over here, it's also shown that you don't need a fully connected um, beyond diagonal RIS 
in order to get the uh, the full gain of um, the, uh, the the full performance gain. So there is a, a structure which is less complex because fully connected would mean you really have a edge between all different ports, and that would be not that would be really difficult to implement. But I think uh, what is shown here on the right hand side is already one implementation that is um, given the same that provides the same gain. Yeah, so in order to come back to the question, it will um, it will require more understanding in which scenarios the the additional um, degrees of freedom um, can can pay off. Please also note that we have considered here single antenna and multiple access channel. So if you go to interference channels or to multi-cell, then uh, this degree of freedom that you have optimizing theta can have multiple beneficial effects, not only improving the signal power, yeah, because here, as you can see in the optimization problem, we just maximize the norm of the total received power. But in interference situations, you would also uh, be able to control the interference. Yep, thank you so much. Maybe we can also add that adding more risk elements means more uh, area required. So if there are some space limitations, be the risk can play a role in decreasing the number of uh, risk elements needed. The next question is uh, uh, from the chat. Is there any optimization technique for thumb rate maximization? Yeah, so, uh, well, this easy thumb rate maximization for single antenna links, yes, um, there are. And then in the second part of the talk, we have also proposed this alternating optimization. Of course, this does not solve the problem globally. Um, it's an alternating optimization, including majorization minimization. So we are happy that it converges to a local optimum. But um, that can be applied to also weighted rate of maximization. So weighted sum rate maximization or minimum weighted rate maximization. Of course, you can also apply the um, uh, the weighted MMSE approach, right? So you know that in literature, in order to solve the sum rate maximization problem, with the local optimization, again, um, the, uh, people provided to use this approach using the duality between mutual information and um, MMSE. And so there, uh, the weighted MMSE approach can be, so can be used in this um, framework as well. Yeah, so that would be one optimization technique. Thank you. And then the, there is another question regarding the figure in slide 18. Yeah. The previous figure. If you could provide the technique or function in simulation platform that was used to generate the random unitary and symmetric um, Boolean group connected risk as the benchmark. Yeah, so usually we, usually we put our research on GitHub, uh, so to, in order to have reproducible research. But um, uh, yes, uh, so we should we should do that if we haven't done it yet, because then you are able to reproduce exactly the same curves. You know? So would you just write an email to me or to the first author, uh, Ignacio, and then he can share the simulation code. Uh, it is implemented in MATLAB. Uh, with you directly. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And maybe a last question uh, regarding the assumption done on uh, full, uh, perfect, I guess, uh, channel state information. In the optimization procedure, in the case of base station risk user channels, do you also assume know that you know the singular channels, base station risk and risk user? or only their cascaded version, base station risk user? Uh, so this is, of course, a very good question. And yeah. um, I, I completely agree that the assumption knowing each individual uh, channel, so in this case, knowing the channel matrix G and the, the vector F and the vector D uh, is a very strong assumption. Um, in particular, uh, it's difficult to estimate the, the uh, individual channels if theta is a passive device. Um, I agree on that. Um, in, in this work, we have assumed perfect channel state information even about G and F in order to find um, 
the expressions, the bounds. Yeah, so they, um, for the beamforming optimization, we only need to know the effective channels, so the product of all three. For the optimization of the RIS, um, we need to know a little bit more. So you can see it basically here. So inside this H, we need to know how the theta operates on the effective channels. And that means we basically know all three channels, F, G, and the product with theta. Um, I know that there are works where um, there are schemes suggested like code book based um, RIS optimization that might be also reasonable here to consider. In, in this work, we have considered perfect CSI. Yeah, thank you. I guess this was the last question, if there are some I, uh, I, more interest. I just have one question, uh, one answer to the very last question. Yes, we have also a work where this structure was extended to star RIS. Yes. OK, <laughs> that's uh, the very last response. Thank you very much, Professor Jorswick, for, for the talk. And yeah, this concludes the second webinar. In the third will be in two weeks from now. And, the invited speaker will be uh, Professor Lina Mao from Shanghai Tech University. Looking forward to see you there.